Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, it's recording. No, it's you. Yeah, it's ICR. So it's going to be in our drive. Okay. All right. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending to our second expert series this summer. Uh, we started, ICR started this, um, this series of events every second Saturday to engage the community and also to be able to bring experts to those talks and share local uh, knowledge about wildlife um, to everyone. And also that way we can connect our field events to the all that people are learning through those talks. So um, Anita Arenas is our speaker today. And she got her first exp exposure to wetlands and research in 2012 during a summer research internship. She immediately fell in love in doing wetland research and continued being involved in a wetland ecology lab with Dr. Christine Whitcraft. After the internship doing research on the invasive tamarisk along with assisting with other ongoing research up until she graduated uh, with her bachelor in science from Cal State Long Beach in 2017. After she graduated, she continued volunteering in wetland research and started working with Endemic Environmental Services in 2018, where she learned some new skills such as identifying birds by sight and sound, completing nesting bird surveys, biological monitoring, and restoring sensitive habitats. The same year, she also started working for ICRE, helping and teaching high school students how to properly connect research, uh, collect research data uh, write scientifically and present data in scientific poster presentation. After a couple of years, Anita decided to go back to school in 2020 to get her master's in science at Cal State Long Beach with Dr. Uh, with Kraft as well, while he's still working for endemic and ICRE. Um, I think this, this is a nice uh, bio that Anita wrote, but I have so much more to add, Anita. Uh, I, we've been working together for the past, I think I would say almost four years now. And she's always willing to do a little bit of everything. You forgot about your additional wildlife training. She's been doing mammal trapping, tortoise um, court. You did the training as well. Um, she's always volunteering and always wanted to be everywhere to learn a little bit of everything. And that's what makes her such an amazing professional to work with. Um, and this is just the beginning of our career together, Anita. So thank you so much for speaking today. And um, I look forward to hear your uh, presentation one more time because I love it. Thank you, Luma, for that introduction. Um, and thanks for you guys for being here today. Um, hopefully you guys could be able to learn a little bit about what I've been doing these past couple of years up for my um, master's thesis project um, on the iris. Um, just let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, Luma, can you accept that I could be able to share screen? Luma, um, can you hear me? Yes, I do. I didn't get the permission. I was looking through the other sides here. So maybe I'll, no, I want to be the host because I want to accept people. Good. Apply for everyone. Okay. gonna try again okay let me see um no not yet <laughs> do you want me to get the host back and then so i could share the screen and now I'll, i could send it back to you yeah i'm just allowing you now Um... 
let me Ah, oh, okay, that did not work. <laughs> Why? Oh, as, to yeah, as soon as I make you me. host, um, it, it stops sharing. Wait. Uh. Yeah, so just to stay you as a host in, um, I mean, we'll, we'll try to. Okay. I wish I could be a co-host, but I don't know how to make a co-host. Uh, neither do I. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay, so thank you again for coming today. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about what I've been working for my thesis projects on the effects of iris pseudochorus on abiotic conditions and the invertebrate communities in a Southern California estuary. Now to start off with, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about what a wetland is. So a wetland consists of any land mass that gets inundated by water either periodically, seasonally, or permanently. Now a periodic wetland is when the wetland gets inundated during certain parts of the day due, due to the tides coming in and out. And you could be able to see some of our local salt marshes, which is a periodic wetland and here in Southern California. So some of our local salt marshes can include Bolsa Chica, Upper Newport Bay, um, and shown here would be the Seal Beach uh, wetlands. And the, here in these two pictures, you could be able to see the picture on the left-hand side, which is the wetland during a uh, high tide. And the picture on the uh, right-hand side is that exact same spot during low tides. So you could be able to see that big difference between throughout the day. Uh, now, a seasonal wetland consists of a wetland that gets inundated during certain parts of, uh, of the year. And this is mainly due to big rain events. So an example of that would be an ephemeral wetland or a vernal pool. And you could be able to see uh, one of our local vernal pools here in Southern California at Costa Mesa at Fairview Park, where some of you guys may know um, and have seen. Uh, the next one would be a permanent wetland. So a permanent wetland is when the vegetation is inundated um, all year round. And an example of that would be uh, those mangrove forests. Unfortunately, there isn't any here in Southern California, but you could be able to see them in other parts of the world, such as in Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Texas. Now, uh, one unique thing about wetlands is um, the vegetation is very adapted to be able to be inundated in water during those uh, time periods, as well as the um, inverts that live uh, in those wetlands and be able to survive in low oxygen conditions. Now, wetlands are very important because they provide 40% of all biodiversity globally, and that includes both plants and animals. But they also provide a lot of human services, such as filtering water, providing buffers during storms, and reduce erosions. But in California alone, 90% of our wetlands have been lost due to human activity. And to be able to get a better picture of our wetland loss, here is a map of, southern, of some of our local wetlands, um, here depicted in green. And you could be able to see the, the acreage that we have in total in white, um, our historical wetlands. And in red, we see um, the wetland that uh, the wetlands um, available that we have now. Um, so we could be able to see um, how much wetland loss we've had since 1880 to 2016. And of those remaining wetlands that we do have, they have been degraded by stressors such as invasive species. Now, an invasive species consists of any species that was introduced to a new place. Um, um, by humans, either accidentally or on purpose. 
and this introductions of species that can cause ecological harm. Now, especially if these invasive species are introduced to a wetland ecosystems, they can make a lot of changes, such as being a lot taller um, and could have even a showy flower as well. Uh, these invasive plant species can also outcompete our native vegetation and change the composition, pollination, trophic, trophic interactions, nitrogen cycling, and productivity. Now, especially if these invasive plant species have that uh, showy flower, they could try to attract a lot more pollinators towards them compared to the native vegetation. They can also increase the invertebrate abundance and alter trophic interactions among species. So changing them from primary consumers to secondary consumers. So for example, here where we have a caterpillar that eats a, a lot of leaves, will change to a secondary consumer such as a spider that eats other insects. And we see this shift due to the increased size of the canopy size, uh, where, they wet, where the spiders could be able to use that canopy to be able to build their webs. Now the invasive uh, plant species that I primarily focus on is on Iris pseudocorus or yellow flag iris for short. And it gets its name from its bright showy flower as you could be able to see here on this picture. Um, it is originated from North Africa and Europe, um, but it was introduced to the, to the United States back in 1771 as an ornamental plant. They tend to flower during the months of May through July, and they are able to spread very easily due to the buoyancy of the seeds. Now, this is especially important in wetlands because in, in the wetlands, you, as we saw, like in salt marshes, the tides are coming in and out throughout the day. So with the tides, um, they are able to pick up those seeds and be able to disperse them all along the coastline. So to be able to get a better picture of that, here is a map of California. And you, in the areas in, um, in yellow are where the iris is uh, located. So we could be able to see that the iris is located all along the coastlines and along watersheds. And we see a similar pattern all across the United States. Where here, um, the areas that are in, are in red is the iris locations. So we could be able to see that iris is located around the west coast, the east coast, and along the Great Lakes. Now, there are some positive impacts uh, where the iris is located, such as uptaking nitrogen, phosphorus, cadmium, and copper. They can also reduce E. coli and salmonella by a span of 24 hours by 50%. And they can also help filter the water. But some of these negative impacts can include uh, reductions of the abundance of the native vegetation. And the rhizomes can also make the environment a lot drier and change the invertebrates in the soil and alter pollination community. So my study site is located in San Diego in a place called Los Pinosquitos Lagoon. And within Los Pinosquitos Lagoons, uh, there are three habitats. There's the freshwater, brackish, and the marine sites. And all of these three habitats were um, labeled according to the type of vegetations that were there. Now, one thing that I do want to take note is that for my marine sites, I recently had to drop it due to spraying of the iris, but I did have collect um, some samples before that, which I will be talking about a little, a little bit later today. So for my hypothesis is um, that I'm predicting that yellow fly iris will directly and indirectly alter the composition rate, abiotic parameters, aerial, and the soil invertebrates. But first, let's talk about decomposition. So decomposition is how fast um, the plant material is, be, is broken down in the ecosystem. And this is affected by um, abiotic conditions, which includes temperature, moisture, and salinity. It is also influenced by decomposers. So what is eating that plant vegetation? And lastly, plant properties. So what is the plant made of, such as nitrogen and lignin? So for this, uh, what I ended up doing is I collected iris leaves in both my freshwater and in my brackish sites. I also collected native vegetation. So in my freshwater sites, I collected willow leaves, and in my brackish sites, I collected Frankenia salinas. And I selected these two plant vegetation because they were the most abundant in these two locations. 
I place the vegetation in micro, micro glass mesh bags. And then I place them under iris and non iris canopies. Now a non iris canopies consists of any plant vegetation that was not iris. And I place them in 10 different locations in both my freshwater and my brackish site. I retrieved the, um, these bags under a certain time period. And then I, could, I took these back into the lab where I weighed, washed, uh, dried them and weighed them again. And then I calculated the percent decomposition per day. So for decomposition, I predicted that under the iris canopies, that the decomposition rate was going to be a lot lower compared to my non-iris canopies. And this is primarily going to be influenced by abiotic differences. But when looking at the plant vegetation itself, I predict that the iris is going to have a higher decomposition rate compared to my non-iris canopies. And this is primarily due to the, uh, what the plant material is made of. So what did we see with decomposition? So here for my results, um, you see on the x-axis, I'm going to have vegetation. So if it was the iris vegetation or the native vegetation, my plot, plot type, which is um, if it was under the iris canopies or the non-iris canopies, and by site. So if it was under the brackish water site or in the fresh water site. And on the y-axis, I have my percent decomposition per day. And the letters here, if they are the same, they represent that there are um, similarities amongst them. And so what we are seeing is that decomposition varied by site, where in my freshwater sites, we're seeing a higher decomposition rate compared to my brackish site. And it's primarily being influenced where the iris is decomposing a lot faster. But we wanted to take it a little bit step further and we wanted to look at each of these sites separately. So here for my brackish sites, again, on the x-axis, um, we're going to have vegetation, uh, where if it's iris or my native vegetation, and plot type. So if it's um, my under the iris canopies or the non-iris canopies. And what we're seeing that in the brackish site, that the native, native uh, vegetation is decomposing a little bit faster compared to the iris vegetation. And when we are looking at the freshwater vegetation, um, we are seeing that the iris vegetation is decomposing a lot faster compared to the native vegetation. So if you guys remembered a few slides ago, I talked that decomposition is influenced by a few things, such as abiotic conditions. And so one of the things that we looked at is um, salinity and soil temperature. So first, so for salinity, what we did is we collected sediment samples under iris and non-iris canopies, and we collected these sediment samples in my freshwater, brackish, and in my marine sites in 16 different locations within each of these sites. And with that sample, I used a refractometer um, in order for me to be able to read the salinity in the soil. Um, if I was not able to read uh, the salinity in the soil, I took that sediment back into the lab where I was able to use the PACE method for me to be able to read the salinity in the soil. Now for temperature, I also recorded um, the soil temperature in my uh, freshwater brackish and in my marine habitats in those exact same 16 locations. And I use a thermal copper thermometer to be able to read the readings under the iris and the, the non-iris canopies. And so what I am predicting that for both um, the salinity and, ten, and the temperature that I'm gonna have it lower under the iris canopies compared to the non-iris canopies. So for the salinity, I am predicting this because the iris tends to like a more fresher environment um, so I'm predicting that that's why the iris will have a lower salinity under the canopy compared to the native vegetation. And for temperature, I'm also um, um, predicting that the temperature will be lower under the iris canopies due to the canopy size compared to the native vegetation. So what do we see? So for salinity here on the x-axis, I have my sites. So be my freshwater, brackish, and in my marine sites. And where blue here represents the iris canopies and the orange represents my non-iris canopies. 
And again, here letters that are the same uh, represent similarities. So what we are seeing with salinity is that both the freshwater and the marine site was a lot lower compared to the brackish site, which was a little bit higher. And when looking at soil temperature, here on the x-axis, we have the plant type. So if it was the iris or the non-iris canopies and site. So it'd be my freshwater, brackish, or my marine sites. And again, letters that are different represents differences. So we see that each of these sites are different amongst each other. But we are also seeing that in the marine sites that the soil temperature was a little bit higher compared to my brackish and my freshwater sites. So now we're going to have a little shift. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the vertebrate community. So the first thing that I'm going to be talking about is about canopy dwelling invertebrate communities. So for this, what I did is I did two different methods. Um, the first one was using sticky traps as seen here on the picture on the D left hand side. So with the sticky traps, uh, we place these um, in the iris canopies and non iris canopies. And we left them out there for a duration of uh, two hours in my freshwater, brackish, and my marine sites. Um, now, we also did is I also used uh, these mesh bags as in the picture in the middle. And with these mesh bags is we placed these over the iris flower to collect it, as well as the non-iris canopy vegetation. Um, in order for us to be able to see what was using both the flowers and the non-iris um, canopies at that exact moment. Now, the reason why I did that is because these sticky traps only collect any invertebrates that are flying by, flying by at that given time. So if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, we could be able to see that there is a jumping spider actually using the iris flower. So if we would have only used the um, sticky traps, we would have missed a different, a variety different of other invertebrates that are using the iris canopies. So what I am predicting with my invertebrate communities is that for the sticky traps, um, I am going to have a higher abundance in the iris canopies compared to my non-iris canopies. And this is primarily going to be due to the um, inflorescence of the iris flower. And for the mesh bags, I am also predicting that I'm going to have a higher abundance in the iris canopies compared to the non-iris canopies um, due to the flower as well. So here are my results for these sticky traps. So here again on the X axis, I have my sites. So if it's on the freshwater, brackish, or my marine sites. And on the Y axis, I have the um, abundance per, um, per sticky traps. And where the blue is my iris and my orange is my non-iris canopies. And the letters here represents uh, differences amongst each of them. So what I could be able to see is that each of these sites are different on all three of them. Um, but we wanted to take it a little bit further and we wanted to see what was causing these differences on all of these three sites. So for that, what we did is we did a CAPS analysis. And here, the way that you would read this is um, if two points are closer to each other, um, the more similar they are. And if two points are more further apart, the more different they are. And the colors here represent different sites. So the blue here represents my freshwater sites. The green is my marine sites. And the red is my brackish sites. And for what we are seeing is that in my freshwater sites, I have more of the mucidase and the calucidase. In my brackish sites, I have more of the agromycidase. And in my marine sites, I have more of the thysinopterus. Now, when looking at the uh, mesh bags, um, here again on the uh, x-axis, I have my sites. So if it's freshwater, brackish, and the marine sites. And here where the blue is iris and orange is my non-iris canopies. And again, letters here represents differences. And the asterisk as well shows differences between the iris and the non-iris canopies. So what we are seeing is that each site is different 
uh, amongst all of them, but we are also seeing that differences between the iris and the non-iris canopies in the freshwater sites and in the marine sites. So again, we wanted to see what was driving those differences. So again, we did that CAPS analysis. And here, what we are seeing is that in my iris brackish water sites, I have more of the carabidase and the craftsmalidase beetles. In my iris marine sites, I am seeing more of the Tysonopteras. And in my iris freshwater sites, I'm seeing more of the Tenebrionidase. Now we see how um, the iris is affecting the, um, the aerial abundance of the invertebrate communities, um, but we wanted to take it a little bit step further and we wanted to see how the iris is affecting the ground dwelling invertebrate communities. So for that, what we did is uh, we actually did some pitfall traps. And so for the pitfall traps, we placed these under the iris and non-iris canopies in my brackish and my freshwater sites in 16 different locations. And what we did is we got these Effendorf tubes um, and we filled them up with water. And with that, we placed them under the iris and non-iris canopies um, and we flushed them to the ground and we left them there for durations of 24 hours. Now, the reason why we left them there for 24 hours uh, was because of the disturbance. So when we cause a disturbance in the soil, a lot of the invertebrates gets attracted to that disturbance. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to prevent um, that difference uh, by leaving that tube in there for a, for a duration of one day. After those 24 hours, we went back in the field and we collected those tubes and then we took out the water and we put 10 millimeters of propylene glycol. Now, the reason why we use propylene glycol is because it's a good preservative, as well as it will not evaporate that fast. Um, so it would, you could be able to leave them for a long duration, a long periods, uh, long periods there. So after we fill them up, we flush them back into the ground. Uh, we put these pixel savers over the, um, the, the tubes, um, and we left like about two, two centimeters off the ground. And the reason why we put these pixel of savers over them is to prevent for any large mammals to be able to go into the tube. Uh, we left these tubes for durations of, in the fields for durations of four hours. Um, after those four hours, we went back, we collected them and we took these back into the lab where we washed, sorted them and ID them to the lowest taxonomic level. So what I, these are what I am predicting with my invertebrate communities. I am predicting that under the iris canopies, I'm going to have a lower abundance of the invertebrate community compared to my non-iris canopies. And here is uh, our results. So here on the x-axis, we have plot type. So if it's under the iris or my non-iris canopies and site. So if it was under my freshwater or in my brackish water sites and letters that are the same um, are, um, means that they are similar. And on the Y axis is my abundance. So here, what we are seeing is that um, there is a difference by sites and is primarily being influenced in my freshwater sites where I have a higher abundance in my non-iris canopies. So we wanted to see what was driving um, these differences. So we perform again a non-metric MDS, um, and you read this the same, the, very similar to the ones that I had shown before, where two points that are closer together means that they are more similar, and two points that are farther apart are more uh, different from each other. And here, um, the ones, the triangles that are in blue represent my freshwater sites. And the ones in red represent my brackish sites. And so what I am seeing is that in my freshwater sites, I am seeing more of the Transocestia isopods here. And then I am also seeing more of these, um, okay, um, Limethoma ants right here. So what is all of this telling us about the iris? So, so far what we are seeing that um, the yellow flag iris is decomposing a lot different compared to the native vegetation. 
So we are seeing that um, it is the, the iris is decomposing a lot faster in the freshwater habitats compared to the uh, brackish habitats where it's decomposing a lot slower. And obviously decomposition rates is affected by abiotic differences. So the salinity, what we saw um, was a little bit different within all of those three sites, but there was no differences between the iris and non-iris canopies. Uh, we also saw that temperature did not influence how fast the decomposition rate is going between the iris and non-iris canopies. But we did see that the temperature was a lot warmer in the marine sites compared to the freshwater and in the brackish sites. Um, we also think that obviously plant properties has a lot to do on how fast the decomposition rate is going. Um, so especially in the freshwater site, since the willow leaves are a lot more woodier compared to the iris vegetation, um, that could also definitely influence on how fast the decomposition rate is going. Now, when looking at the invertebrate community, uh, we are seeing that the iris is affecting um, the abundance um, between the iris canopies compared to the non-iris canopy. So we see that we have a higher abundance uh, in all of those, those three sites on some of them. Um, and we are also seeing that the soil invertebrates is uh, varied among sites. Um, especially in the freshwater sites where we see a higher abundance um, in the um, non-iris canopies compared to the iris canopy. So we could see, we see that big decrease under iris canopies. So what is all of this telling us is that, you know, all of this information is giving us a better idea on the impacts that iris is giving us in all of these three locations. Um, it is also telling us how to prioritize when trying to remove the iris within these locations. Um, so obviously we are seeing that, you know, like the decomposition rate is going a lot faster in the freshwater sites. Um, it's affecting a lot of the ground dwelling invertebrates under the iris canopies. Um, so maybe our priority should be uh, going to removing the iris in the freshwater site first compared to the brackish and in the marine sites. And this information not only will help just working of the removal of the iris in those pinosquitos, but this information could also help on the re removal of iris um, in California and all around the United States. So with that, I would like to thank you for listening to my talk. I definitely want to uh, thank everyone in the wetland lab for helping me collect all of my, um, my samples and helping me process a lot of this um, data. And as well as like to thank a lot of my funding sources for this project. And with that, I would uh, take any questions. Yay. <laughs> well, I think I flew that by that really fast. <laughs> it was a good fast. You did good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, it was a good pace. I, I, I really, I, I think you did very well. <laughs> um, I have um, a question. Oh, good. You go first. Okay. Um, so, you see a difference in the uh, in the invertebrate communities for ground dwelling and freshwater between the iris and the non-iris canopies. Um, do you have any idea, maybe, why that that's the case? Um, that is a very really good question. Um, yeah, like so, especially like I think like in the freshwater sites, I've been noticing especially these past couple of years, the iris has expanded so much um, compared to the brackish and then the marine sites. So within these past couple of years, like where you would just see like a small patch of iris, like let's say, for example, it was like this small, like it grew like, you know, triple or, or quadrupled its size in the freshwater sites. And this is primarily because the freshwater, um, the iris does tend to love more like a fresher environment instead of a more saline environment. Um, so I think that has to do like why it's, a, um, you see that difference right there. Um, and we just recently actually just collected those pitfall traps this summer. Um, so that is definitely like a big, um, a big difference right there. And I have actually done some, some mapping of iris like from a few years ago. 
Um, and then I also did some mapping um, this uh, couple of months ago, and um, I was able to calculate the growth rates of the iris within all of those three sites. And you could be able to see how much it has grown. That's pretty awesome that you're actually mapping the growth. My question was actually pretty similar to this. It involves that um, the area as well about restoration because my my concern is that every year the invasive plants they behave differently. We have bad years of um, mustard going on, and then the next the following year we have Clover. So, in a in a restoration perspective, we do need to approach different uh, methods to restore areas. And with you seeing the growth rate with the years that you that you're doing the research, do you think there is different approaches that you could do to restore, or um, is still too early to? Yeah. Um, so. Like kind of like what I had mentioned like earlier in the talk, you know, we I did have to drop my marine sites um, because they did this, did they spray the iris? Um, but it really did not work <laughs> because we saw like that growth of the iris again. Now iris does have like a very um thick rhizomes on them. Um, so we think that not only is the iris multiplying by the seeds, but also rhizominal rhizomonally. Um, and, you know, we've done some, um, we collected some genetic information that, that we sent out um, to someone else that does a lot of genetics to see if they are, you know, spreading either by rhizomes or by seeds. Um, so definitely, I think like if we would have to remove the iris, I think like the best way to be able to do that is removing them by rhizomes, because we do know that they tend to grow um, through the rhizomes a lot. I have another question if yes. uh, no one else has any. Um, are there any native plants that are structured more similarly to iris? Because I noticed that iris is a, a monocot, right? They, they kind of go straight up. Um, but a lot of the native plants are, you know, like they, they create more shade, right? And uh, like underneath their canopy. So is there anything that iris may be out competing that's more similarly structured? that you know of? Um, I would say, um, so I know like, especially, I know this is a little bit different, but like in the freshwater sites, I would use to see a lot more of like these small little um, vegetation that would grow on like on the ground. Um, and these, this last, this year, I really did not see them because of the spread of the iris. Um, I think like the freshwater site is the only one that I kind of really saw like a decrease on some of the vegetation that we used to have. Um, in the brackish site, um, I haven't really seen like a decrease of any of the vegetation that used to be there. I mean, like they're still growing, but um, but there's not like that big decrease like in the freshwater sites. And in the marine site, I think it's pretty much just the same. Um, it's just like within that big patch. Okay. You guys have any other questions? Yeah, I think I have one. Okay. So I'm just curious, are there any other invasive plants or animals that are within the same location of the irises or that may kind of change the salinity, the, um, the composition or any, that may skew your results in a sense? Um, so there is. Um, so I know, especially in the brackish, uh, the brackish sites, we have um, a lot of, uh, oh my God, what is it? The radish. So it's also a flowering plant. But where I collected my data, uh, we didn't see any of the radish, but I do know that um, there is radish in the brackish sites. And last year when we were doing the pollination observations, so I had to observe the iris um, being pollinated 
for like 180 hours. So that was like a long week and a half there. <laughs> um, looking at pollination in both like the iris canopies and like non iris canopies. And what we saw was um, where there was the radish um, next to like iris canopies, uh, the pollinators tend to like more going towards the radish compared to the iris. So that definitely is going to affect on how like the radish would, you know, like populates in that area as well. And we've seen like a few more radishes over the last, I mean, like I have seen it anyways, like populate a little bit more compared to the, a couple of years ago. So definitely, you know, there is some other non-native plant species there. Okay, and what about um, invasive animals? Has there been any of that? I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't seen any invasive animals there. Um, I would say maybe in the freshwater sites. Yes, in the freshwater sites. So there is an invasive caterpillar there in the, in the freshwater sites, which I think it's pretty funny because um, I've noticed that those caterpillars only eat the iris leaves. So I thought, I thought that was kind of interesting that, you know, we we're seeing like that abundance of, increased abundance of the iris in the freshwater sites, but I'm also seeing the abundance of those caterpillars in the freshwater site. Also, Rigo, give, give Scarlett a big hug on my part. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Yes. So you said that they, they are native to Africa and Europe, right? Yes. Do you know if they grow better here or there, or if there's any like significant differences in their characteristics? You know, that is a very good question. Um, we actually do have a collaboration going on with a person in Spain. His name is um, Jesus. Um, so he is currently right now in Davis and we're actually going to be meet meeting up with him in a few weeks, um, but Originally, he's doing a lot of the iris studies out in Spain. Um, so one of the things that we are looking at to see is obviously like the pollinator community um, to see um, how often the iris is being pollinated here compared to in Spain. We are also looking at um, fruit sets. So seeing um, how many seeds it produces um, here compared to in Spain as well. Um, to see if that is being influenced um, on where they are um, being populated. Um, because especially when non-native plant species are introduced to a new environment, you know, they're trying to adapt to that new environment. Um, so one way for them to be able to adapt to that is um, being able to um, grow rhizomally um, instead of using um, the fruit sets. So they could be able to actually um, self-pollinate themselves too. So that's one of the things that we're trying to look at. Awesome, thank you. I'm eager to find out. Yeah, yeah, I think like the other thing that we're also gonna try to do is we're all look, also looking at like leaf length, like how tall like the iris is growing and as well as like um, flower size as well. I can help with that. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so I guess if there isn't any other questions, um, thank you, you guys for coming and for hearing my talk. Um, Luma, I don't know if you have anything else to say. No, just thank you so much, Anita. You did a wonderful job. It was a really, really nice presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And we'll continue to do this every second Saturday. We'll be sending emails um, about the next ones and what is going to be the topic. So stay tuned on our Instagram account. <laughs> yes, so next month's talk is going to be on, uh, it's going to be another wetland talk, you know, so, you know, you guys better show up. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's on a Saturday, I should be. Yes. <laughs> you know, the, the 
images that you showed from uh, from Seal Beach, uh, I think they're from Perimeter Pond, right? Like all the way out to like, um, one of the back. It's like all the way at the end where, you know where they did the augmentation site? Where they did a lot of that in, uh, research? That I don't know. Oh, okay, <laughs> well, I guess I'm gonna have to show you when I see you next. Yeah, show, show <laughs> me a map of that because I, I, I was thinking, I'm, I'm really surprised that I never uh, run into you over there. But then again, I had not met you before this job. So um, I could have seen you at some point, but it's just like a very familiar little spot right there. Um, yeah. You can see the cranes off in the distance that I would that I would monitor. <laughs> so yes. Um, yeah. Anyway, you did a really good job. I like you. Thank your you. Job.